What a thing to do in your dying moments. Where's the bloody phone? Oh, Angie, I can't go on. This is the first morning I've washed up for ages. Good morning, Nisby House. Yes? Monday the 7th, I think I've got one left. Who's it for? Miss Jill Payne, that's UPS. That's our last room gone, Jackie. I bought it during my last chemo, and I actually moved into the hotel on the 1st of July. Now, anybody who's done chemotherapy knows, you know, to move house at that point. I didn't know how I did it, but I did it. The thing about chemotherapy is, you know, people walk in the hotel and I look at them and say, oh, God, if you look well, because I've got these steroid cheeks, you know, and I'm a bit fat. Um, um, and I say, yes, I am well, thank you. And, but when you go bald and you lose your eyelashes and you get that, you don't make your new skin because, you know, chemotherapy stops things growing. I mean, you look like a victim, you look ill. And so people are embarrassed and they are overly sympathetic and they start maybe to cry and, you know, Viv, where's your hair and all of this. And then, you know, that's the side of it. Hi. Have you got more stuff to bring in? I can't do it. I'll leave them to do it. Are we all having yet another cup of tea? I was going to say, make a throw. Poor old well. bloody Fergie. I've never felt so sorry for anybody. They're really bullying her, aren't they? Woody Allen. Now, he reminds me of my husband. I hope he's got the same thin lips. I bet he's a moody bastard. You haven't done a good job with that bloody casserole dish, George, but just buy a bit for me to move. What casserole dish? That stainless steel one needs all that brown rubbing off it. There I go again. It I'll needs... Again. It needs... Get all that brown off. That's it. It'll come off in two minutes. See, if we thought I was going to pop my clogs in three months, it had all fit in rather well. We could finish the hotel, I go across the Great Divide, and George goes back to his flying course. But it doesn't look as if it's going to work out like that. Did you, did you, Maggie Tink spoke to me last night? Oh, what did she say? Well, my liver scan is inconclusive. They don't know if it's shrunk, stayed the same, or it's grown. Right. So they said it's a total inconclusive. They can't make head and tail of it. Really? Which obviously, in one Can't way, they pop you in the MRI scanner. And well, it's not. It's five hundred pounds. Oncology have got no funds. They're asked, they've been asked to play bloody god now, by the sodding conservative government. Um, I'm thinking of I'm putting gonna bring... my ashes in there, but I don't know. But we may, may not. <laughs> we may not say anything in case it puts people off. I don't reckon. But no, but I don't you know. think it put people off. Do you? No, it means your spirit will continue to blossom. <laughs> oh, Charlie, you're such an old hippie. North, east, south and west. And it's, it's the spirit circle. And, uh, and then some other good friends gave me this. I think it needs to go on a plinth. He looks a little lost. And I think if anywhere, you know, to leave one's remains, this probably is his nice spot. Just in the centre of the circle. Well, no, they can stick it anywhere, really, can't they? And if anybody else liked the idea, they could come in here too. We could all be in together in future years, Nigel. But I mean, if the kids sell the property, what do you do? I don't want to run it, really. My sister doesn't want to run it. She's doing law at university. Um, Mum, if she was well, she'd continue to run it because she does like the business. She's put a lot into it, and um, but she's not really able to do that anymore. So we have to look at the other options. It's it's a hard. I think it's a hard way to make a living. And I'd rather be up flying aeroplanes. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Oh, 
Cott. In the words of Jane Fonda, make it burn. What are you lot doing in there? This is the British working man. It's slapdash and tickle. <laughs> Roommate's one of my favourites. I like roommate. Um, let's just go upstairs a minute and look at room four. Bloody Nora. She's not giving us some massive guilt trip that if we sell it, it's we've let her down. I mean, all she's trying to do is set the business up for either selling or keeping. Um, by finishing off the last six bedrooms, the whole hotel has been finished to the same standard with her choice, her decisions, and so it's been a continuous Vivian refurbishment. It's looking good. It's looking lovely. And if she was sitting in some little flat overlooking the Downs with no business, with nothing to get up for in the day, I think she would have deteriorated long before now. I think it really has kept her going. Um, I mean, there's not many people who can say, well, you know, I've had breast cancer and I've had, you know, a lumpectomy and pulmonary embolism and chemotherapy twice and now for the third time. And at the same time, I've been running a business with um, refurbishing it from top to bottom. You know, I mean, it's a tremendous feat. Ruthie, darling, you put a pink thing in here, yeah. you cover it up with a cream. I want two colours. I don't two. want 25 colours in a row. Uh, we'll, we'll two colours. I think it looks lovely. That light needs to go in the middle, Marion. I want the edges of the carpets doing, Marion. Uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth, Ruth, I don't think she's been in here yet. Okay, sweetheart. They love it when I nag them. So do you have to decide between being a pilot and running a hotel? Well, the, yes, I do actually, because this business is, is a, it's something that you could never really, or I probably could never really afford to buy in the future. And it's a chance to be your own boss. It's a healthy business. It's got um, a very good reputation. It's in a lovely area where I've lived all my life, more or less. And I'm sort of choosing more or less to pass it up, to do my flying. I travelled in South America, went to Bolivia, Peru, got robbed, crawled back to England eventually and thought, right, it's now 93, I've got to make a life in England. I've got to consolidate with my children and forget the, some of the crazy times that I've had. I looked at pubs, I looked at hotels, I looked at everything. At the same time, at Christmas of 93, I funny feelings in my, in my breast. Christmas being Christmas didn't take much notice. But in January of 94, I was diagnosed with an advanced breast cancer, and it really was advanced. They started to treat it. It seemed to respond well. Um, and I was convinced I wasn't going to die. I went to walk on the downs one day, and I felt here that I wasn't going to die. I used to cook a wicked breakfast. This is the first breakfast I've cooked for weeks. I don't realise how ill I am, actually. I used to whack around here. And I'm having, it's all I can do to... Uh, I'm only doing it this morning. I don't think that's probably the last time I'll ever do it. <laughs> oh, it's like a, a miracle cure. Does that look pretty? Would you fancy that? Lovely. Thanks very much. I wonder if I'll go to the great to the great domestic cleaning centre in the sky. <laughs> I shall probably be the ones, the angel flitting around with the feather duster doing a little light dusting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Let's sit down before I fall. Uh, I'm going to get an ashtray and have a fag and to hell with it. I'm pushing for me Botticelli. No, it's funny, when you think about my life, I was married three times. 
I wasn't very good at it. And, um, and I was domestic. Domestic all through the years when it was non you to be domestic, you know. You'd go to a little party or something like that and people would say, what do you do? And I'd say, well, I'm a housewife. And that was the end of the conversation then. People drifted away. I had an art gallery for a little while. I dealt in politics. All sorts of daft things, diversional, but they were basically, I'm a domestic person. And when I had to make my living, what was the best way to make my living? Look, George wants to fly aeroplanes. Hattie wants to be 20. Money? Well, I'll probably come out of it with enough to buy a little house with or something. That's a damn sight more than a lot of other kids have got, will ever have. So what do they want to work 18 hours a day for? when they look at me dragging myself around, as I have done, they think money's not worth it. It wouldn't have been their achievement either. They would inherit mother's achievement. I don't think it'd be any good for them to live under that auspices, really. Um, my daughter's got to be her own individual person, and so is my son. But at the same time, sort of throwing away a potential income of 80 grand a year, <laughs> sort of, you know, Makes you want to spit, but you know, what is it they say? Youth is wasted on the young, or more bitter than a serpent's tooth is a thankless child. <laughs> you know what's going to happen? They're going to get to about forty or fifty, and they're going to get pensioned off because I'm sure the workforce by the time they get to that age will be from the age of fourteen to twenty-three, and after that everybody's on the scrap heap, and they'll look back and say, "Oh my God." Why didn't we? We do. But I can't, I, I can't get upset about it. I think for me, at this very point, it is the fact that when that painter and decorator come down the stairs and the girls polish those tiles in the hall and the brass is polished and the paintwork sparkles and I stand outside and I look at it, I've actually done it. I actually took a very tired, worn out, bedraggled place and have made it as, as I made something of it. After that, what's there to do? Living gives you cancer. Cancer's not a modern disease. Cancer was written about by the Egyptians. Cancer was written about by, by the, the, the Romans, you know, the people who sat and watched their tumours grow out of their bodies. This is not you know, there was no diesel pollution in those days. There was no uh, nuclear energy. There was no fast food. There was no, I don't know, did they smoke anything? I don't think they smoked. I've never seen a sphinx with a fag in its mouth, have you? Um, you know, there was none of that. It was all going on then. Why, you know, I think, my personally, this, this, this Western self-obsession with diet, fitness, health, this enormous fear of death. I mean, good God, I men should say I'm dying to somebody, and they, they literally, they can't cope. The fact that 200,000 people die a day is neither in nor there. The fact that it is the ultimate inevitable, that, you know, to, for everything, every tree, plant, dog, person, building, it, it, you know, they, but they all live in, we in the Western world are so bloody precious about ourselves, it's unreal. You know, I've been in South America. Life expectancy on the altar plano is 41. If you can get to 41, you're doing OK. You know, and now we jog and we eat our vegetables and we take our pulses. You know, I mean, it's a total, utter self-obsession. There's no humility in it. You know. So are you scared of dying? I, I am not, you see. I have had moments when they said, Vivian, you know, I'm sorry. And I said, what's going to happen to me? And they said, well, you'll go to bed one night and you won't wake up. Or you will be ill and you'll, you'll go to sleep and you won't wake up. And I did admit at that point my stomach went like this and sort of two tears, you know, uh, I came. I found that unutterably sad. Um, but fear, I, I, I just, I haven't got it. I don't want to go. I keep saying to everybody, actually, I don't want to go. 
But as far as fear is concerned, no, I, I am not frightened. You know, I think it's the last big adventure, really, isn't it? We're all certainly having an adventure. Yes, yes. They say c cancer is a spiritual gift, or a, a long illness, or facing your mortality, whatever. It, there's no two ways about it. It alters a lot in your mind. It really has some of the most delicious moments. Delicious. All that angst and anguish all through my bloody life over things that really don't matter to fish's tits. They just don't, they just don't matter. And then all of a sudden, and, and I'm like, all that energy for what? I've bought books on how to die by people who haven't got a fucking clue. You know what I mean? I just, and I could throw those. It's all anger. Let your anger out and do... What a load of rubbish. We're just... We're mortal. We will die. We can't all go out at 70. We're not going to have people bloody frightened to death. I won't have it. I won't bloody well have it. Living's hard enough. Problems are hard enough. Getting through, paying your bills, making yourself beautiful, hard enough. And then when the time comes, when you make your peace and you think, right, okay, and then you've got to be frightened on top of it. I don't want to cut any with buds on. Don't tread in any dog turds. <laughs> right, I'm going to do this one. I'm going to do this one for my bedroom. One said car on four years' higher purchase. <laughs> I get that one, Vivian. I got it. It's too heavy. <clears throat> you know, it looks so pretty when the flowers are lovely. It goes well with the dust. Right, we've got them all. Now it is. We'll go yellow. We'll go purple. Right, we'll take out those things. It seems a shame to throw them out when they're um, just got a day left to live. Perhaps it's the way I'm feeling. <laughs> Don't you think? Now those are quite okay. Binnables. So you're going through the bin now? Well, no, Deirdre put them in the bloody bin, didn't she? All right. Oh, that's quite nice. Can you do my funeral, Deirdre? I know yeah. it's upset you, darling, but I want everybody to bring one flower. And I've got visions, you know, of... I think it's a lovely idea, that, don't you? Mm. One yeah. flower? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I think it's a good idea. Monday last week, it was sort of everyone was going around putting the finishing touches on it, and the guy came in to value it on Tuesday. And um, um, Mum, I know, was very sort of she was quite weepy at that stage, and whether that was her treatment or whatever. But I think, in a way, she was so pleased that she'd finished it and she'd achieved it. And she was sort of happy weepy because of that. And then in another sense, you know, I've finished it and I've achieved it and now no one wants it. It's not that no one wants it, but no one's willing to work in it. I think I think that's what sort of upsets her most. Yeah. And then one thing and the other, you know. There was no nothing in the fridge and because the mates didn't come down for the weekend and I thought, what the fuck have I done all this for? Mm. Then nobody wants to play hotels because it's all too rather boring and 
Work, it's it? a bit like hard work. You could go, what do I want to do that for? Mm. I want to be a student and I want to fly aeroplanes. I don't feel that at the age of 19 I can run a hotel. Um, I'd like to do my university course. Um, and George wants to do flying. We need to kind of have a little think about your TLC though, don't we, and work out what we can do to make you feel more TLC. More TLC'd. Well, don't you think it's time for one was TLC? I think it was, but I mean, like, it is, but I think it, part of that is you should. your decision about what you feel you need. Um, hi, Ali. Hi, hi, uh, sorry, I didn't realise you were uh, having a party oh. here. Chocolate. Chocolate. She's the only one look at that. Chocolate <laughs> Excellent plain, 70% cocoa. It sounds like it should be a good one, whether it's best or it's not. it's lovely lint. You're a good girl, Ali. So that's part yeah, of the TLC right. process, yeah. just on cue. I come you back, I come back from the hospital, <laughs> and she's there with a box of Belgian chocolates on my bed. Brings me a cup of coffee in the morning. Make sure I'm still breathing. I bet every time she opens that bloody door, you wonder what you're going to find. <laughs> Yes, she does. <laughs> it's true. It all started off with George had his cat's tooth out. George he had his cat had the tooth out, so he right. had to go at half past three. Right. Hattie came in at half past four, had a sandwich and a shower, and caught a lift at five o'clock. Mm. I had, I didn't know what I had for dinner. I don't think I did have anything. I felt so wretched. And I struggled in the kitchen. I'd run out of Horlicks, mm -hmm. which was, my acid was mm -hmm. terrible. And I'd found some yogurt. And I went, and I opened the fridge, and the fridge was bare. And then on the Saturday morning, George came in, and he sat, and he said, oh, he said, I popped into Waitrose, he said, and I, um, he said, I went to the fish counter, he said, and I bought this little piece. He said, I wanted a piece of fish without bones and nasty bits and things in it. And you sit in there, and you think, like this, and he said, and the, the, the man at Waitress said, what do you want it for? And he said, well, it's for my cat. He's had his top out. And I looked at this son of mine and thought of my daughter. And I thought, for what reason has one done all this? <laughs> God, I mean, I, I'd hate to think how I'd be in her situation. It'd be awful. I'd have probably jumped off the bridge by now, actually. I don't think I would have... I don't think I'd want to go through what Mum has gone through. Um, you, you I, I don't think we can begin to imagine what it must be like. Because I would, uh, I don't think I'd cope. She's coped really well. It's only the last week she's been bedridden. Up until then, she's been fine. Um, people will go out, or, you know, we could go out and meet people, and um, she'd say that she's still ill, and they go, but you look so well. And she did. You know, she really did make an effort and carried on going. So this is, a, this is as bad as I've ever seen her, health-wise. And with that, you have to accept that she's going to be more difficult. So, you know, she become more ill, you become more difficult, the family suffers more, you know. And that's probably why I'm not so concerned about the business. Oh, and a gas bill, British gas. God, this is a heavy-duty morning, isn't it? Bloody Nora. Alison Redioff, that's Alison's. Oh, and a bank statement. Could anything get any worse? <laughs> I just had to take my temperature. <laughs> the almighty. Oh. 27,334 pounds overdrawn. <laughs> oh, God. No wonder I panicked to finish the place and get it valued. Dear Mr. Bank Manager, and when on Saturday she announced that she was going to give the hotel to the bank, how did you feel about that? Well, when people are so ill and so depressed and fed up, they say a lot of things they don't really mean. And um, you have to take it on the chin and not rise to the bait and say, you know, and, and try and... Con and, and, try and argue against it, you've just got to listen. I don't think Mum would ever do that. 
She just wouldn't give the bank her business. I'm proper poly at the moment, feel proper poly. <laughs> so is this the poliest you've ever felt? The last week, yes, I think so. After three years of this cancer treatment, I think this is, I feel rough. He's very knowing, this dog. He knows when I'm going to the hospital. I swear blind he knows. He behaves in the most peculiar fashion. He's not a lap dog, he's not a softy. He doesn't like anybody really to touch him. He's a very independent, yappy thing, but he's become extremely protective. And he goes funny on Wednesday mornings. I managed to get George to talk about the funeral last night with my funeral plan. And that seemed fair enough, you know. He seemed to quite like that. We had a row about the harpist. I want a harpist. I mean, if you're going to be this to it. He said, oh, Mummy said. Oh, he said, we won't have the harpist there. He said, we'll have the harpist playing here when we all come back. I said, you bugger off, George. I said, it's my bloody funeral. I said, I want somebody playing the harpist. <laughs> but he wants it for the party when he comes home. <laughs> oh, God, I thought that was funny. And we're going to sing Sweet Low, Sweet Chariot, coming forth to carry me home. I looked over Jordan and what did I see? The host of angels looking after me. <laughs> it was a nice word, wasn't it? There's nothing heavily god botherish in it. I hope nobody breaks into the rugby version. Clive assures us it's secure. Mum knew the risks involved. 